this is David Fuentes. In this video, I'd like to explain why I believe that music is made of figures, not individual notes. In the introduction to this three-part series, I said that a sentence is made of words, not letters. So when I write out a sentence, I don't think about each letter. I think about words or even a whole phrase, and the letters just come together. Here's another analogy. When an artist paints a portrait, he or she uses single brush strokes. But that's not what we see when we look at a painting. We see the figures, not the paint. Even when a painter paints in a way that makes the brush strokes visible, that's not what we actually see. Our brains pull together individual brush strokes to make something we recognize. I can't go into the psychological processes involved right now, but our brains are always on the lookout for something they recognize, even when we look at cloud formations or abstract art. In fact, without the ability to recognize, compare, and anticipate patterns, humans couldn't hear music as music. Each note would remain an isolated event. So instead of hearing this, you'd hear this. Now, even though I tried to individualize each note, your brain was still able to anticipate the next one and the next and connect them all together into a larger pattern. In fact, you couldn't help it. Let's look at this phenomenon in the context of a real piece. Here's the music for one of Bach's unaccompanied cello suites. As you listen to Yo-Yo Ma play, ask yourself whether any of the patterns sound like patterns you've heard before. Zigzaggy pattern at the beginning of this piece sounds a lot like the opening notes of the Batman TV theme. Batman! And the arpeggio I've marked reminds me of a song I learned in kindergarten. Good morning, the term for this type of recognizable pattern is motive. Most people think of motive and figure as synonyms. Not me. I've sequestered the term figure to mean something very different than motive. A motive has a specific rhythm and shape to make it sound unique and recognizable, even when varied. most famous of all motives is this one. No one who has heard this piece can hear this motive and not think Beethoven. If musical motives are memorable, figures are just the opposite, entirely generic. Figures are the basic building blocks of melody, and a building block needs to be fully adaptable. Think stem cells, brush strokes, lumber, yarn, phonemes, clay, or Legos. And that's certainly true for this piece, which is built mostly of one figure, the three-note scale. But unlike the motif from Beethoven's Fifth, which has a bit of fire in his belly, no single three-note scale sounds very interesting on its own. Nor are any of them especially memorable when played without the others. And there's something else that separates figures from motives. Figures line up with the meter, whereas motives can start or end anywhere. Remember, music is organized around beats. This means that the first note of a figure will be a little stronger than others that follow. I'll go into this a lot more in video too, but for right now I'd like to look at the figures that I haven't marked yet. Here I use colors to indicate different figure types. Scale figures are blue, neighbor figures red, and arpeggio figures green. The three types of figures I've marked are the only three kinds of figures that exist. That's it. Every piece of music you know is made of scale figures, neighbor figures, and or arpeggio figures. Why? Because melody has a harmonic dimension. What do I mean by that? Well, that you can sense the harmony from a melody even when the melody is played by itself. 
This is possible because the majority of notes in a melodic figure will be chord tones, and there are only so many ways to arrange chord tones into melodic figures. Let me show you. Scale figures connect two or more chord tones using passing notes. Neighbor figures ornament a single chord tone with a non-chord tone. By the way, the R stands for the root of the chord. Arpeggio figures are made entirely of chord tones. Now Bach didn't compose any of the figures in this cello piece, or any other piece for that matter, just like I didn't invent any of the words in the previous sentence. But that doesn't make either of us unoriginal. Remember, figures are building blocks, essentially Legos for melody. Musicians don't compose figures, we use figures to compose melodies. And like Legos, we can build absolutely anything we can imagine with melodic figures. I hope this becomes clear as we look at a couple other pieces that use three-note scales. Like the Bach piece, Do Re Mi is made mostly from three note scales. But the two pieces sound nothing alike. In fact, you have no idea how many pieces use the three note scale as their primary building block. Well, that should be no surprise. It's like saying you have no idea how many houses are built of bricks, or you have no idea how many sweaters are made of yarn. Here's the real surprise. Before now, we haven't gotten very far talking about melodic building blocks because we haven't considered the relationship between melody and meter. But if you think about it, it just makes sense. Musical meter is deeply intuitive, and it's so physical that even babies and many animals respond to it. Doesn't it make sense then that meter would be a key to understanding music? After all, music is organized around beats. Let's look at one more example. Let me tell you how I chose this song. On the day that I had the idea for this blog, I just googled most popular songs 2018. Perfect was at the top of the first list I found. Truth is, it's impossible to find a good song that doesn't use figures in interesting ways. Here's a bit of Sheeran's pre-chorus. Let's start with the long notes, which I've marked as arpeggios. It's easy to see why I call the C, B, G, D an arpeggio, but you might wonder how the repeated notes early in the phrase qualify. In melodic figuration, when all you hear is chord tones, it's technically an arpeggio. But notice something interesting here. In the normal arpeggio, the melody might move through the root to the third to the fifth, but here it's the harmony that moves under a repeated note. When the harmony changes, the repeated note switches position. It moves without moving, and when it switches position, it sounds and feels new. I call this reverse arpeggiation. Now for the eighth notes. Once again, our old friend the three note scale. This time there are only two, or wait, maybe three? That group of notes at the end of this excerpt has the same shape as a three note scale figure, but let me tell you why it isn't. Remember that I said that figures line up with beats? Primarily, that means that the first note of a figure falls on a beat. The three notes at the end of this excerpt do form a little scale, but that group of notes starts off the beat and lands on the next beat. So when we look more closely, we find that this is a neighbor figure, not a scale figure. Let me show you why this matters. Each figure has many unique features. I'll talk about just three in this video. The first one I'd like to talk about is shape. And just for fun, I'll use flowers as a comparison. Some figures have smooth or linear contour, just like some flowers have a very smooth or simple shape. Some melodic figures have a jagged or spiky shape, as do some flowers. And some melodic figures seem to split into a high part and low part in a similar way that some flowers have compound structures. The second aspect that I'd like to mention is that different melodic figures project harmony in different ways. Now I already showed you this with scale, neighbor, and arpeggio figures in the Bach example. Here are those figures once more. We definitely get a sense of five harmony from all of them, 
though the arpeggio is the most vivid, while the neighbor figure is milder. By that, I mean that there's only one chord tone. Going back to flowers, some flowers have intense colors and fragrances, while others have fainter hues and might not smell at all. The third aspect I'd like to talk about is that each figure type has its own sort of rhythmic momentum. For example, some figures seem to hover, while others clearly move. So about the flowers, when I thought about plants that move on their own, this is all I came up with. The last thing I'd like to show you is that it's possible to switch out one figure for another. Now, I've got to be honest. This is one of my favorite things to do when I study other people's music. Each figure represents a choice a composer makes. His or her decision has a powerful effect on the song's emotional impact at each moment. For those of us who love music, listening to what could have been speaks to our minds and hearts about why the composer did what he or she did. When a composer leaves sketchbooks, we can actually see his or her revision process. Here are Beethoven's sketches for his funeral march. I won't explore them in detail, but I've highlighted three places where his decision to switch figures is particularly impactful. You might want to review this slide when you have some time. With composers who don't leave sketchbooks, we have to use a little more imagination. Here's a good rule of thumb. Look for places where the composer does something unusual. For example, listen to what Sheehan does with his three-note scale. He doesn't do the normal thing, to use the scale to connect the main notes of the melody together. Instead, he makes his three-note scale feel like it's going somewhere else, then jumps back to the starting note. This really emphasizes the gently lilting, wholehearted feeling that Sheeran hopes to create. Now listen to the difference when I change Sheeran's three-note scales to neighbor figures. The song becomes less song-like and a little bit more like speech. This is exactly what some songwriters want for certain songs, especially in a verse where it's more common to explain how the singer feels than to show how the singer feels. But Sheeran wants to be more emotional here, so the neighbor figures aren't the best choice. Listen carefully and judge for yourself. I'm only changing a few notes, but why do they make such a big difference? wrap up, I want to ask a question you've probably been wondering about. Did Sheeran, Bach, or Rodgers and Hammerstein actually think about figures? No, at least not consciously. Musicians learn figures in the same way that we learn language, intuitively, by ear. So why bother studying something we pick up intuitively? Why do writers study language? Why do runners train with coaches? Studying figuration intensifies our most intuitive responses to melody. Learn the basics of how figures work, and here are just a few things that will happen. You'll never get lost for a way to rough out a pretty good melody. Once you have a good basic sketch, you can use what you know about melodic figures to change it up to make it really sing. There are 21 basic melodic figures. Once you know them, you can make any passage more interesting or more expressive by switching one figure for another, or by varying the original. Figures let you be more deliberate about creating musical contrast. And we haven't even gotten to some of the best stuff yet. Be sure to watch the next two videos. If you were intrigued by anything I introduced in this video, you're really gonna love my ebook, Figuring Out Melody. It's helped over 3,000 people across the globe compose better, and it will do the same for you. You owe it to yourself to follow the link below this video to find out more and get your copy. Thanks for watching this video, and if you have any questions or comments, please share them. Till next time, bye.